of people. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a pleasure to um, see some old friends in that participants group uh, and lots of names that I don't know. So if I haven't met you before, um, this isn't how I'd normally like to meet people behind the camera, but um, it will do for now, won't it? So um, have we got any answers to that question that's on there? We've got David De Gea, Sammy Hippier, James Milner. What do people think? There's something, they probably got quite a lot in common, to be honest, but there's something in particular I'm looking looking at. Um, so um, if you if you want to add your answers, but we'll, in, in a few slides time, we'll find out the answer. So if there's something that comes up, um, Ted's going to man the chat box anyway, see if uh, see if anyone gets the correct answer. No prizes though, just for pri just for fun. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about professional background, but there's been three things that I've been doing over the last uh, 20, 25 years, um, and that kind of sums it up, I suppose. CV on a slide. Um, I can't remember the last time I didn't have two jobs, so there's always been bits and pieces of that going on um, at different times. Uh, Kev's already mentioned Ministry of Football, which is the accumulation of lots of years' experience, mostly abroad in Papua New Guinea and New Zealand, coaching and coach educating. Um, more recently, I was part of the FAP unit until a couple of months ago, um, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed working uh, in teacher education, uh, looking at sort of development of movement skills um, and holistic child development through PE. And I've recently started a, a new contract um, at the Health Foundation, which uses my degree in population studies. There's lots of stats coming up, although I will try and uh, make it as user friendly as possible. Um, but um, I suppose the thing that draws those three things together really is, uh, is a passion around science. Um, in all three of those, the things that um, make me most excited about my job is when, when I get to study the human condition, find out about people, what drives them, uh, what motivates them, what we think this thing called learning is, um, how people develop skills, for example, what motivates um, different types of people in different cultures and different organizations, for example. So, um, and I try and use numbers and data in order to do that, as, as well as obviously uh, my own experience. Um, we will be talking about birth order, um, and I'm going to start just with a couple of definitions. So just to be really clear what birth order is, um, it's the order that you're born in for siblings. For example, Jack and Bobby up there, Jack was born first, so he's birth order number one, and Bobby would be two, and Venus and Serena, Venus would be one, Serena two. So um, the first born is birth order one, and then later born is a, a later birth order, um, or sometimes a higher birth order. So it's just to make that really clear, it's nothing to do with relative age effect. It's not about what part of the year you're born, it's just you in relation to your brothers and sisters and siblings. And the other, the other term that might come up over this, uh, this presentation is family size. And so we're talking about family size, we're talking about the numbers of siblings in a family. Yeah, so not to do with how mums and dads. Um, that along the top there, and I hope you can all see the screen okay, I'm sure Kev will jump in if, if there's IT issues. That's, that's pretty much what I'm going to go through. So I'm going to start by talking about me, which I'm going to try and go through quick because I don't really feel very comfortable talking about myself very, very often. Um, I want to talk about the study that I've done um, and why I did it and what, um, what my motivations were for it. Um, a bit of time looking at the methods and what I found out. I'm then going to introduce you to those who haven't met someone called Etienne Wenger, um, who's done some theoretical work uh, around education and something called communities of practice. Um, and then the last bit really links very closely to the work that um, you did with Mark Haining last week, those of you on Kev's Coaching Club last week, about reflection, about vulnerability. And I'm going to open up a little bit there and sort of talk about during this process of doing this research, what I was going through, what some of the problems were, um, and how I've tried to reflect uh, since then. Um, but beginning, we are going to do a little poll. I'm interested in knowing a little bit more about who's on the call. Um, and I'm also interested in getting your brains thinking a little bit about some of the experiences you've had around birth order. So most of that will come from the uh, families that you grew up in or families that you've known. Um, you would please tick all of these that apply. So you should now find on your screen um, some, some of the same statements. So any of those that apply to you, you can tick them. If you need to tick all, all eight, actually I don't think you could tick all eight, but you might be able to get six or seven, or you might just one or two.
Okay, um, brilliant. So I think there's there's a there's another purpose around that, which is um, I'm going to be sort of generalising quite a lot as we go through when I'm looking at data and numbers in, in quite a large sample of footballers. Um, but I think it's worth pointing out there isn't really such thing as a typical household or a typical typical childhood. Um, there may well be cases of people who feel that actually their childhood wasn't particularly normal. Um, they maybe grew up in more than one household, had different siblings at different times living with them. And actually every, every situation is quite unique. So I want to acknowledge that from the beginning. Um, we will also a bit later get a chance to maybe talk with others in breakout rooms about our experiences being a younger sibling or an older sibling or an only child, or watching our own children grow up and develop, or perhaps nephews, nieces, perhaps your own parents, perhaps friends that you've got kids, perhaps families that you grew up near, um, they're all really relevant um, examples that you might draw on to think about um, how you might frame this thing called birth order. So um, the bit about me, and I think this is quite important because um, there'll be some stuff I say this evening that you probably will disagree with. There'll be some stuff that makes you think and make you, makes you think, well, that wasn't my experience. And there's been times during the study that I'm going to present to you when I've had to try and think about my own bias and my own context and how that was affecting um, the results that I was finding and my interpretation of them. So to come clean and be completely transparent, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes just telling you a little bit about my own upbringing. Some of it will probably resonate with you and other bits you think mm, it's a bit different. So I was a middle child. I had an older brother and younger sister. Um, and I've given that picture, that is not me, obviously, that's Seb Co. And in front of him is Steve Ovet. He's just uh, probably early 80s in a world championships or, a, or an Olympics. Uh, me and my brother were fixated by any kind of sport that was on the telly. So we guaranteed we would have watched that race. For me, being a, a middle child was a bit like being um, a long distance runner when they're sat in the pack in a nice, uh, comfortable position and they can see the front of the, of the race and they can take their time and they're not pressured and they can hit their, hit their top speed when they're ready and go by and overtake. Um, I looked at my brother's example of living and growing up and I thought he was the one who was at the front taking all the flack, no one to follow, couldn't see what was behind. Um, and I think that was a, that was made me feel very secure in my upbringing as a middle child. Um, I was raised in a single parent family. I think that makes a difference to an extent in the sense that um, my older brother took on a um, a role perhaps as, an, as a father figure at times, which may have been very different had I had a dad around. And then in terms of the football learning, because we're going to be talking a lot about that, um, I didn't join a club. I wasn't in the school team for very long. Most of my football was done with friends. We learned in a completely adult free environment. And I think that's very relevant when I, when I come to sort of interpret some of the results a bit later. And this, the second thing is I've got a couple of kids. So you'll be familiar with that kind of toy there. Um, when my son Max uh, first got one of those shakes through one of those holes when he was, you know, big fat nappy sat on the floor of our old flat. And I remember him well because I was there, my wife was there, my parents were there and um, my wife's parents were there. There were six of us and he put probably that triangle through the triangle hole and all of us applauded, in a, you know, it, it was such a big deal and such a big event and he looked super proud and the rest of it. When, when my daughter... Well, actually, I don't remember my daughter ever playing with this toy. I mean, I'm sure she did. I'm sure now if I gave her something like that, she'd be able to do it. But I have no recollection of that same experience for her because by the time she was born, we were already a family unit. She just had to join in. And there wasn't the same time and attention. And I think that a lot of that difference in the way that they've been brought up um, explains very much who they've become and who they're becoming as they grow. Um, so my experience of looking at birth order comes from my own family grouping and then my own um, new family as a, as a father as well. Um, this is something that's been bugging me for a long time, this birth order thing. I remember, I'm going to have to include Diego Maradona in my talk tonight just because uh, he passed away recently and he's, he's one of the big hero of mine. I remember in the 1986 World Cup, um, obviously Argentina knocked England out in the quarterfinal. The next round they went on to play against Belgium. And in the lead up to the Belgium Argentina semi final, there was a, a little focus on Maradona, you know, a montage of all his greatest things. And there was someone they gave like a few minutes on his upbringing and, and they said, Oh, he's the fifth born in the family. 
And I remember thinking, even at the age of 11, watching this, I was thinking, you see, I knew there was something, something about birth order. I wasn't at all surprised to find out Maradona had four older siblings. It just seemed to fit for me. I thought, yeah, that makes absolute sense. Um, and so, so this is something that's been on my mind for, well, I said 46 years. That's probably a bit of an exaggeration, but it's something that's on my mind. So um, in the last uh, 12 to 18 months, I had the chance to do a postgrad certificate at the University of Worcester. And for my major piece of work, I chose to look at birth order. So a lot of the slides and the presentation, the results I'm going to be going through is part of that postgrad certificate piece of um, academic research. So although I've presented this slide deck before, um, I only have 20 minutes then, and I'm hoping to spend a bit longer, especially at the end. What I'm really excited about is finding out from you what this means to you, um, because that's the bit that um, so far I haven't really tested um, or reflected on. OK, um, one last thing before we go into breakout rooms. So uh, the chat box is there. Um, Feel free if there's things that I rush through a bit too quickly, things I don't explain very well, things that you think I'm not sure about that, things that resonate with you and you can give another example, throw it in the chat box and we'll catch up with, with Kev a little bit later on, on, uh, on how we're doing with that. Um, talking of which, I'm now going to pass over to Kev because we are going to go into breakout rooms. And what I'd like you to do with whoever you end up in a room with, um, obviously introduce yourself. Don't spend too long with the introductions. What I find when I've been on breakout rooms recently is that you spend so much time talking to people about who they are, you forget about the actual question, which might, you know, is part of connection, isn't it? Um, what I really want you to focus on is how might older siblings advance or accelerate development? So you'll see that's a leaded question. It's a loaded question already. Um, but I want to get into the nitty gritty of this and find out what you think. So it might be that you say, I don't think they, I don't think they do for this reason or this reason. Um, but I'm trying to lead it towards that for reasons that will become apparent later. So share your own experience. Um, think about football development in particular, but it might just be social development. It could be athletic development. Think four corners, certainly. Um, and when we come back, we'll just get someone maybe just to pop in the chat box one or two of the things that you, that you talked about. Kev, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Mark. Um, so if you can just make sure you take a note or take a, a screenshot of the uh, the actual question if you're going to find it hard because you won't be able to revisit it so please make sure you you stay on task for the question uh, and then feed it back so we're going to put you into a breakout room mark how long we're going to put them in for well i put 10 minutes on there i think that's probably about right but i, I certainly don't think we'd, we'd want to be more than that um i don't know maybe eight minutes go eight minutes what does people think about that? eight minutes Perfect. Okay, so we'll go for eight minutes and we'll give you a, a two minute warning. So you'll receive a, a message that will be sent to you like a, a text message broadcast to all that says rooms are closing in two minutes. So make sure you've, you've had a chance to wrap up uh, and your, your conversations. And so you've all got a chance to consolidate your, your thoughts and feedback as you're leaving the, the breakout room. So the rooms are assigned at random um, and you should get an invitation any second now and it will probably come up in the three dots uh, by the bottom of your screen. Uh, they should be coming through now. There we go. I hope you enjoyed having a chat about that. That's it's the kind of thing people could talk about for a long time, I imagine, because you're talking about the things that are very personal and trying to summarise that with, with four or five other people in the same room. But I hope you I hope you got into some thinking around that and got the, the brains going and um, had yourself challenged a little bit, listening to someone else's stories of their upbringing too. So um, in that chat box, Kev's going to keep an eye on it, but it'd be good to just put down a brief answer to the question um, from your room or from your own personal experience about how might older siblings advance or accelerate development. Um, that would be really, really handy. Um, and I will crack on. Let's just have a little check at that chat box, see how we get in there. Thank you, thank you, Tim, for starting us off. I mean, I think that's, uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that, that resonates with some of the, um, with some of the academic research we'll be presenting. 
not necessarily in that language, but the same same ideas of uh, uh, of speed speed development um, and being able to copy. Uh, thanks, Tony. So keep keep those ideas coming because I think it's um, it's useful to be able to um, see what what you discussed really for me, so I can relate it to what's coming next. Brilliant. Okay. Um, right. So I'm going to present a little bit of um, where are we? So the younger sibling. So one of the first jobs I had to do when I'm thinking about birth order, and I wanted to find out that that key question about how and why might and how and why does perhaps birth order affect uh, football development and football achievement. Um, and so as as is the case with most good academic research, the first thing to do is go and look at what what all of the other academics have written. Now, if you go on the internet and you look at what um, younger siblings and older siblings, there is just a ton of websites and web pages and things that have like personality um, descriptions of, oh, if you're the oldest child, you're like this. And if you're the middle child, you're like this. But there's no evidence behind almost all of it. It's all just um, a bit like horoscopes, really. It's all just people's thoughts and views, but without any real academic research. Um, and the truth is there isn't much academic research about uh, sibling development um, and birth order in sport. What there is, is as normal taken from US, from Australia, from um, English speaking Europe, from Scandinavia. Um, so there's, there's, there's been, there's probably about four or five studies I found that were really strong and really had some conclusive uh, things to say. So what I've done on this slide here is tried to summarize it. So you'll see in the middle, that's kind of a timeline from birth up to adulthood. So I've tried to plot onto that timeline and some of the key findings of the research. Now this slide is gonna get busy. I'm not expecting you to read all of it. I'll try and summarize it anyway. So on the bottom here behind, below the line, I've got some of the uh, bits of research around competition, around how, and I saw one or two of these in the chat box around how younger siblings and older siblings compete. And the younger sibling wanting to be like them, wanting to beat them, wanting to overtake them, wanting to um, win, etc. So you've got things like uh, um, in the specialisation years that older, younger siblings are more likely to choose dangerous sports. Um, and in the investment years, those years coming into adulthood, when we sort of get um, really invested in that professional journey, uh, sibling competition is that motivation to train harder. So. You relate that to maybe your, your Serena and Venus Williams. I'm sure that was probably a factor at some point. Um, the idea around competing for parents' attention comes in here. So a lot of studies have shown that the older sibling is more likely to do well academically. So if they're taking that role, then the younger sibling um, tries to find a niche opportunity by being the one who takes more risks, by being the one who's a bit more um, outgoing by, by being the one who's a bit more physical, perhaps. Um, and the academic research is trying to sort of say that that's, that's to compete for parents' approval and attention. So to summarise below that line, a lot of that fits with uh, the Darwin's theory of evolution, of competition, of survival of the fittest. OK, so the, the, sibling, the, the older sibling being someone to beat. Um, but there's also the other side of it, which came through, I think, Pete Prickett, you mentioned both of these in your answer to the chat box. Um, so this is more about a collaborative approach between the siblings. So the older sibling might be someone to follow, to emulate. Um, a, a role model for work ethic is just there. Um, older siblings take over from parents as role models during the investment year. So uh, this, this links to um, more of a social theory of learning, this idea of working together. Um, to accelerate development. And we'll be looking at this idea of uh, social peer learning from Bengal as we go. Now, I'm not for a moment suggesting that in, in any sibling relationship, you're either above that line or below that line. I'm sure, and looking at my own sibling relationships, that there's times when competition is the, is the key driver and other times when collaboration is the key driver. And, and if you watch children play, siblings play, they can switch in a moment, can't they, from I wanna beat you and do better at this than you, to I'm gonna help you out, let's do this together. Um, that's just perfectly natural and normal. I'm not, put, I'm not for one moment saying that one was more likely to succeed than another either. I really wouldn't know. But the reason why I focused my research and my study and my attention on the social side of it was because I think looking back at my own bias, um, my brother was quite a bit bigger than me. Um, 
there was no uh, there was no way that really competitively I was going to win very much. Um, we had much more of a collaborative relationship, and I think for me, some of the stuff above the line was more resonated a bit more strongly with my own experience. So that was what drew me in to look at more of a social theory of learning. Um, so thinking about that, and we're still sort of on a, an early bit part of this presentation, I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, choosing the learning theory. So um, social learning has always been something that's um, struck a chord with me. So thinking back to early football education courses that went on, my level one, two, your A for B, things like that. You know that situation where you walk into the new room in the, that, you know, that, that the tutors set up um, and when I did my level one two, I wasn't working for a club. And I remember walking in and there was a table and there was a Gillingham coach on it and um, two Luton coaches. And I went to sat, sit with them. I wasn't just in a normal tracksuit and they had badges on. So straight away, there's a kind of hierarchy there that comes from the fact that they're in, in clubs with a badge on and I'm not. And then what happened was a Chelsea coach walked in and came and sat down with the Chelsea badge on. And all of a sudden that social hierarchy or our perception of that hierarchy changes again. And I think that th those kind of hierarchies really do dominate what people learn in, a, in an experience. Um, and I think it's a question we could try and use a bit more often, either rhetorically in our head or actually maybe with learners. How has the social hierarchy in this course or in this learning experience helped or hindered your participation in learning today? I bet there's quite often that if we gave people the chance to say it, that actually they didn't really feel like they were fully participating in the learning experience because of something that may have gone on or their perceptions of, of the relationships in the room. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about community practice a bit later, but the reason why this resonated with me per partly was because the tutor at uh, the University of Worcester was a friend of Etienne Wenger's and uh, um, had spent a lot of time really um, engrossed in this learning. They explained it to us in a way that was quite inspiring and very detailed. Um, what resonated with me straight away was this phrase that learning is not a result of teaching. Um, and, and I've always felt that of all the teaching that's happened to me in, in my life, that I've learned a lot, but it's not always been as a result of what's tried to be taught to me. Um, I've, I've often felt that the relationship between community and learning is really strong. So, um, and I suppose we can go into that a little bit more later, but there's a reason why I chose that particular um, theory. It would have been 20 something years between my first degree and going back to uni and I'd never really considered what a learning theory really was and how to really use it and demonstrate it so the word um and I've had to put it in notes here because it's still not familiar with me ontological this idea of what do I feel learning is and how does it happen was something that I probably um explored in a practical way during that 20 years but actually to dive into the literature was um pretty full on so um, on to what we studied, what I studied, uh, the methodology. So I wanted to find out uh, about birth order and football achievement. The, the best place to go to find that kind of data was very famous people, because very famous people have got Wikipedia pages and they've got books that you can buy for £2.50 on, um, on eBay. And they've got um, people um, who are absolutely obsessed with them and write all about their entire lives and family history. Um, on various blog pages and websites. So the place I went was the independent newspapers, top 100 greatest ever Premier League players. So elite men's football at the very, very highest level. And by studying this group of 100 players, what I wanted to do was find out about their family size and their birth order and use my background in statistics to try and quantify this and come up with something that was measurable and said, yes, there's an effect here or no, there's not an effect here. Right. So that was the real numbers of it. So that quantitative bit, for those who aren't really happy with that, that particular word, it's just one about research using numbers. But there was also um, a qualitative bit. So research using words where I wanted to understand what the footballers were saying about their journeys um, in relation to being an only child or having siblings or um, the rivalry that, or the competition or the collaboration, I wanted to try and put the two together. So if there is a relationship or if there isn't, I wanted to understand it a bit more. And the way I did that was to read um, 45 uh, autobiographies. I couldn't get through to doing all 100. It was too much. Once you've read Yapstam's autobiography, I mean, that that he's as boring as, I mean, he's a great defender, but honestly, I mean, some of the books, you know, it was almost like on page one, they were born and on page two, they were a professional footballer. 
and you had to try and find anything about their sibling and their upbringing in that kind of two paragraphs between. Um, yep, Stan just starts as a professional footballer. He doesn't worry about childhood at all. So it, it, was, it was taxing, it was difficult. So the sample I used in the end was actually 81 of the footballers because for 19 of them, I couldn't find any data or I found data that I just couldn't be happy with. So for example, someone like Joe Cole who came um, through foster homes, um, I just wasn't really sure that thinking about that experience and trying to quantify it was relevant. So there was one or two examples like, like that where I, where I just left them out. And there were others where I simply just couldn't find, find information. So the sample is 81, 81 of the very, very best footballers that have played in the Premier League. Um, this doesn't include this last season. So um, what did I find out? Well, um, one of the things I found out straight away, before I did any stats, I just started looking at what I was finding and it seemed to me there was something odd happening. Now, when I gave the poll to you earlier, um, none of you had really, really big families. And I think that's normal because of the cultures that we were probably brought up in. But Premier League footballers come from all around the world um, and their family size and the cultures in those families will be different. And that's a challenge to try and interpret. I've put here an 11, I've, I've, I've stuck Nanny in goal because I'm never sure why he made the list of the top 100. Um, three defenders, three midfielders and four attackers. And these are the big families. So look, Sol Campbell, 12 to 12, Nanny 9 to 9, Dwight Ewell, Kate to 9. So these, these are the 11 that have got really, really big families from that um, 81. And you'll see straight away, and I hope you're noticing what I'm noticing, that that's a really attacking lineup. You know, you've only really got Sol Campbell as your, as your defender, you know, Essien and, and King could, could do a pretty good job of making a back three there, I'm sure, but the rest of them are really attacking players. And that straight away got me thinking, what is it about big families and attacking players? And maybe there's something around that. Um, so just by looking and starting, and, and I got the football stickers out and I started playing and just put trying to categorize people and thinking, what's happening here? What's, what's going on with this? What could I try and explore and experiment with? Um, so then I started using the data. Now, some of you are going to be, uh, this, this slide might not resonate with a lot of you because this is where we present the, the stats results. So the first table there just looks at the family size. So um, this number three here, this is your David De Gea, James Milner, and it was uh, Sammy Hippier, three only children. So they were the three only children in the sample of 81. There were 27 footballers who, were, who had one sibling and there were six of them on the previous slide, most of them who had seven plus family size. Yeah, so that's just the distribution of where those 81 sit. So you'll see straight away that there's, it, it seems to me that that's um, a larger family size than you'd expect. Um, so then what I looked at was birth order. So um, 28 of them were the first born, uh, 27 of them were the second born, etc., and 16 of them were, were fourth or more. So in other words, they had three older siblings. Now, what we're able to do with that, those bits of data, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this now, is you can work out what we would expect the birth order to be, okay, given the, prop, given the distribution of the family size. So given this distribution of family size, we know, for example, that all three of those ones there will be birth order one. So we can work out what's expected of this group of footballers if they were a completely normal group and they fit um, the mold. So birth order was just randomly allocated. So then we get two distributions in observed and expected. We can do some clever maths using something called a chi-squared test. And we find that the probability of having this observed group is less than 1%. So in other words, it's very, very, very unlikely that this distribution of birth order happened by chance. And we can therefore conclude 99% sure, actually more than that, that birth order is important in the development of footballers because their birth order is significantly different from that we would expect. Okay, so that's a, that's a powerful piece of data. There's a lot of research people do that, that doesn't come up with anything. So um, it wasn't surprising to me, um, but it did make me think, wow, there is something here. And it got me excited about doing other similar research in, 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 other, in other situations. What would that look like, for example, if it was championship footballers? What would it look like if it was La Liga instead? What would it look like in women's football? What would it look like if we went to the... Um, academy entrance level and we, we looked at 11 year olds who were signed into a professional club. Would we see this distribution? Does birth order arise then or before? I, I find all this really fascinating, something I want to explore more. Um, okay, so we're going to go on to look at the relationship. So that, that, that kind of tells me that there's something going on that slide. That's kind of, yeah, there's something here, but it doesn't tell me about learning. It doesn't tell me about why this has happened. It doesn't tell me about the, the 
cause causal relationships here. Um, to do that, I needed to start looking at these footballers' biographies, and I, and I framed what I was reading by looking at Etienne Ringer's community of practice. So I'm going to spend a bit of time thinking about this. So, what is a community of practice? Well, right now we're a community of practice. We've we've all come together as a group. Um, Kevin's organised it, and we've all come together because we share a common interest. And that common interest is something around coaching and it's something football-y, but it might not always be that. And it's something about learning and it's something about the game itself. Um, but, and it might not be tangible. It might be different for each of us, but we're all here with that shared um, common interest. Uh, we also have a common purpose. We're here because we're interested in it and we want to take something away from it. We want a few golden nuggets. We want to understand it better. We all have an interest in developing ourselves and progressing. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. And we also have a common skill set and a common vocabulary. If you think about some of the vocabulary we've already used here um, about goal scoring and about attacking and about um, nanny, for example, you know, th these are things that our community of practice today will probably understand. But if I use the same kind of little jokes and, and vocabulary in a different community of practice, it, it would be like, well, what are you talking about? You know, we've all had those situations where you where you go into maybe a new place of work and they're they're talking in new a completely new language and you realize that you're peripheral to that community of practice you haven't really got into there yet and it's something new to you um, and you might decide to join that community of practice or not um, so if you think in your life i'm sure there's lots of communities of practice you, you belong to so for me um, if i think about that um sh that early football experience for me playing in the park with my friends without any adults around that was a community of practice we had some real um, shared experience. We all had a shared vocabulary of, of the kind of things we said when certain things happened. When the ball went over the, the fence, it was, we were always somebody was spoon foot or whatever it might be. You know, we had a we had a, um, a way of relating to each other in that environment, which was very very specific. Um, important, it was voluntary as well, which is important. I think when we relate related to perhaps PE in schools, which we might do a bit later. So Etienne Wenger's work around community of practice came out of a study of apprentices. So it was mostly in African cities looking at people who were working under a master, under, under someone who was the master of their trade. And they were the apprentices who was learning that trade. And what Etienne Wenger found was that when an apprentice had a problem, they were not likely immediately to go to the trades master and say, look, I've got this problem. They were much more likely in the first instance to go to another apprentice to try and sort that problem out. And I've just started a new work at the Health Foundation and I can completely resonate with that. If if I've got a problem in the last few weeks, I don't go to the person who's, who's employed me and is deciding whether I get another contract. I go to the chap who's a little bit like me, kind of like doesn't quite seem to know what he's doing either. I'll give him a call, see if he knows. And it's the apprentices that will share the knowledge. So it isn't the case, again, that this learning is happening through teaching. It's happening through social, social collaboration of people in similar communities. Um, so Wenger says that there's three um, conditions that need to be met for something to be called a community of practice. This is important, I think, because I'm hearing this term community of practice more and more. It seems to be picking up speed as a phrase, a bit like the growth mindset or um, uh, there's, there's every so often there's, there's these things that come up aren't they, in education. I think it's misunderstood. So uh, a community practice is something that has mutual engagement, uh, joint enterprise, shared repertoire. Those are posh words, but let me put them into a, 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 um, some common sense English. So it, we're, we're thinking of these um, footballers in terms of their early football development environments. Can we call those early football development environments, especially in a family situation, a community of practice? Well, I think we can because Mutual engagement, shared interests, strong relationships, books we play, yes, absolutely. A joint enterprise and the vocabulary around how you describe events is important. Um, we have a collective endeavor to score goals and to win games. Um, and a shared repertoire, we have um, a shared menu of games in history. So I think that gives a good um, understanding that these early football development environments are communities of practice and they fit within this social theory of learning. Um, this bit's really important, so I put it in yellow. Look, yellow means really important. Um, so Wenger's four key components of learning. So we're going to go into this in a bit more detail, but um, this is where that ontological bit starts coming in. So what do we mean when we say learning? Someone couldn't do something before and now they can. That's learning to an extent. That's very obvious learning, learning that's visible and that perhaps we can see. But what about all the other learning that happens? If you take someone 
at point X and then look at them five years later, you can see that clearly they're different. But how did all that difference and all that learning, if you want to call it, happen? Well, what Benga says is that these, this kind of learning and these components can be split into these main four frames. And we're going to look at these in a bit more detail with some examples to bring it out. Um, so the first one, meaning uh, learning is experience. So um, there's some really good examples, I think, in, in football of, of players who seem to have a meaning around their play, um, some kind of fundamental purpose about who they are. So think perhaps of Eric Cantona and you think about um, the purpose with which he, he became a footballer. Yeah? So it, the, the essential fundamental reason for doing this, for um, doing this profession, for being a footballer. So, um, and I think this, is, this for me was really important during this year because I was very much involved with the PE delivery in the FAP unit and thinking about how do we help children find meaning in PE? or in football or in any sort of early sports uh, environment, what does it mean to them? For some, it will be about scoring goals and competition. For others, it will be about delight and joy. And Kretschmar talks a lot about this. For others, it will be about social connection. And we need to acknowledge that meaning will be different for different people. So again, this, uh, this um, uh, disconnect between, we might come in to teach this, but actually children and people will take very different things from it because they're different and their meaning and, and their purpose around things will be unique to them. Ronaldinho is the person I've, I've, I've identified. He's obviously not from the Premier League, uh, Greatest 100, but I'm going to use him as the example. So this is him and his older brother. His, his dad died when he was quite young and his older brother, who was quite a bit older, was definitely on the collaboration, not competition side, probably because of that age gap in that relationship. And it was Ronaldinho's brother who um, helped him understand that his purpose in football was to spread joy, to play like you are happy, to play like you're hearing music and to make other people smile. And if you read his words around this and then watch him play, it just fits together really well as, as that older, older sibling relationship being part of this learning through experience. So the next one we look at is learning is doing so, um, or situated learning. So I spent a lot of lockdown one when the kids were, were not in school. I went up to the park a lot just over the road and there's a cage uh, there where they play basketball. And there was a lot of kids coming to play basketball at that time. And it was a it was sort of young teenagers and they would come and go. And sometimes you'd, you'd, we'd just sit and watch me and the kids just sit and watch on the side, see what was going on. Uh, I don't know much about basketball, I should say. So I wasn't looking to sort of in any way to for talent or anything. I was just interested in the social relationships, what's happening here. And it was really interesting when someone new joined the group. How did um, their importance or their competence get recognized by the other people? At first they were unsure that maybe they could do something with that basketball that suddenly meant that they could be accepted, meant that there was some value in them and some competence was recognized. Um, and I think that this is the kind of the vocabulary that we have in sport is around mostly what you can do with the ball in football or in the ball in basketball or in other sports it might be slightly different. And the, the footballer who most epitomizes this in there, this is the opposite of Yap Stam. Dennis Bergkamp's vocabulary, uh, vocabulary, autobiography, if you haven't read it, is absolutely superb. He goes into a lot of detail about practice and about how his uh, three older brothers were absolutely crucial to that practice happening and the learning that was going on when he was just banging the ball against the wall and it coming back, for example, and the meaning that came through that. So a quote from Dennis Bergkamp there is, is um, it was talking about his older brothers, they acted as a sounding board and I needed that more than I needed a manager. Um, so again, this idea of sounding board, that's the social thing, isn't it? Rather than a manager, he didn't need someone teaching him, he needed someone to collaborate with and to listen and to watch and to reflect on and to feedback and to copy and to emulate and to, you know, and he said, I never had many friends as a kid. I didn't need any because I had the best three at home. And I think that kind of sums up this idea of, um, of practice being a really big part of it. And, and if you haven't read it, um, I'll, I'll put a plug out. I haven't got any, uh, any, any profit royalties coming to me for that one, but um, it is superb. Um, if I could sum up how footballers in the 45 uh, autobiographies I read, if I could sum up how they describe their development journeys, I would say that they're best described in a process of moving between different teams from the first team they join to when they make their debut as a professional. That's how footballers describe it. They don't say, oh, I learned to do a half volley and then I, then I had this coach and they taught me this and then I played on the right wing and I learned this. They don't say that. They talk about learning as in I was in this community and then I was in this community and then I was in this community. 
and they especially spend a lot of time talking about the moment when they're younger in an older community. So Roy Keane's a really good example. He has th um, he's the fourth born of five. So he followed his older brothers through that journey, was more successful than them, uh, and obviously made it as a professional um, at the end of that journey. But he talks in detail about when he was young, playing two years up in this team in midfield and how he had to survive and cope. Um, and I think it's something that's probably very, very memorable, that kind of experience. And it links with Wenger's here, uh, that the quote about there's times in our lives when that learning is intensified. Um, but the point of the older brothers and older sisters is that they can fast track your progress into those communities and into the middle of those communities. If you think about Roy Keane and the way he describes it, his brothers had already been in that, in that team. All the coaches knew him. All the coaches knew his family. The coaches knew his dad already. He already knew the vocabulary and what was competence, deemed competent in there. And he could fast track himself into there, not just because of the physical way that he had been brought up, but just because of um, he could get to a state of belonging a little bit quicker than perhaps someone who didn't have older brothers. And I think that is really, really powerful. Um, and probably, um, I'd say about half of the autobiographies I read had that kind of story, very, very similar story in them. Um, so a quote from Roy Keane, when forced to choose between boxing and soccer, there was never any doubt what the answer would be, nor was there any doubt that I would opt for Rockmount AFC instead of my local club where all my school friends played. The fact that Dennis and Johnson, his two older brothers, played for Rockmount was one good reason. At the end of my first season at Rockmount, I was voted player of the year. I was incredibly proud that I had upheld the Keane family tradition at the club where my brothers had played. Um, I love this football. Uh, Paolo Di Canio, um, you know, it, it, if we talk about identity, we, we talked a little bit about um, uh, Eric Cantona earlier. I think this is a really good example. Um, so in the picture here, he's actually, I think it's Everton, isn't he? He's playing, it's, it's the point where he picks the ball up because someone on the other team has been hurt. So he's in possession of the ball, but rather than, and the, and the referee doesn't blow for, the, for a foul or an injury, but he picks the ball up so an opponent can get some, some attention for an injury. Um, and the most obviously famous incident with him is, is the one where, where he's pushed the referee and the referee tumbles. Well, actually, if you hear the Canio side of the story, the Canio got involved in that, um, it, it, with the referee because he was trying to protect Patrick Vieira, an opponent, from getting into too much trouble with the referee. And he was trying to go in there to help him make Patrick Vieira not get in trouble and ended up getting in trouble himself. So if we think about him and uh, this idea of justice, I think it's, it's about sticking up for others. It's about not being silenced. And I think it's very, very powerful and it comes through. And he attributes this in this quote here to his, to his older brother, Antonio. So I'm going to read a longer quote because I think it's... Um, is quite good. It was Antonio who made me want to become a footballer. I loved watching him play. He had all the ingredients you need to succeed as a footballer, all but one. He wasn't right in the head. He would speak his mind always and often with little tact. He was considered a loose cannon, a genuine talent cursed by an unpredictable temperament. Sound familiar? Let's just say I inherited some of Antonio's qualities. Like Antonio, I have never allowed myself to be silenced and never been afraid to speak my mind. Um, a really powerful example of, of this idea of learning, not just being about the physical skills and the techniques of what a coach gives, but how an older sibling in a, in a community, a family community of practice can help you become somebody, um, which is much more deep and uh, personal, perhaps, than just, uh, you know, being able to take a penalty or, or being able to take a free kick or whatever it might be. Um, and my, my final slide on this before we um, before we take some some questions and things and have a little bit of a break because I feel like I've been talking for ages and I'm assuming you're still there at the end of the other end of the screen. Um, I, I find this really interesting. So so we saw that that slide earlier where I had the football pitch and and Nanny was in goal with a three three four and it looks very much like um, our our attacking players seem to come from bigger families or more to the point of the big families there seem to be more attacking players. So. I looked at my list of 81 and I got some more stats on their goals, games per goal. So Sergio Aguero has got the best record. He goes um, a game and a half, a little bit less between each goal. Um, down to Robbie Fowler, who's in 15th there, two and a bit games for Robbie between each goal. Um, I was actually surprised there with Cantona. I hadn't realised Cantona was such a prolific goal scorer. But those are our um, top 15 um, most prolific goal scorers from the list. 
this is their birth order and their family size. So there isn't any in the top 15 firstborn players. If you look through there, there's not that many second born. In terms of family size, there's only two families that have got two children, only a few with three. You've got two sevens, two sixes and eights, a bunch of fours. So uh, again, I did some statistical analysis on this and I found, yes, this is um, improbable. It's not likely that this would happen by chance. And what we can therefore conclude is that yes, um, the most prolific goal scorers are more likely to be later born and they're more likely to have more siblings, a, a, um, a higher um, number of older siblings in particular and larger families. And I think that's fascinating. I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend a bit more time thinking about that in a bit. So um, to summarize where we're at, um, I think this is new. I'm surprised that it's not really out there. I, I, you know, there's tons and tons of stuff on relative age effects all over the internet, and it's well known. Um, it's well known, but still we do nothing about it really. Um, this I think is just as important and just as fascinating, not because we need to do something about it, but because there's something to learn here. There's something to learn about how people learn to do stuff that I think is absolutely critical that we try and unpick a bit. Um, and I want to do that with you actually in a little while. Um, the quantitative results are really strong. What I found was that Wenger's theory was a the well chosen one for me. It seemed to fit. I liked the way some of the vocabulary fit with what I was reading about from um, when I was reading the, the journals and the, and the autobiographies of, of, of the players. Um, so at that point, um, I'm going to grab a drink and um, I'm going to pass over to Kev, who's um, I've given the responsibility of looking at the chat box. I don't know what's been happening because I haven't got it open on my screen. But if there are any, are any Q&A that you want to throw in the chat box now, um, would, that would be a good time because we've got a little bit, few more slides to go before I want to get some discussion going. Uh, so Kev, is there anything that's come through on the chat box or anything you, you thought you'd wanted to ask or clarify? Yeah, so there's a, a few that have come in uh, that are quite interesting um, and some that link together. So I'll, I'll ask it in the in a sort of two two part question, if you like. So one is, um, did you come across any correlation between uh, the age gap between siblings being a significant factor? Um, because Tom mentioned that there was a sort of a competitive streak between him and his brother who had roughly 18 months between them, but not so much when there was a seven year gap. Um, and another one linked to that, I guess, would potentially be access to and acceptance into um, older sibling peer groups uh, in order to be able to learn from them on top of your siblings? Did you come across anything like that? Yeah, fascinating. So in answer to the first question, the, big, the simple answer would be no because of the data. Um, I, it was hard enough to get just birth order and family size information for, for the 81 players. And if I, I, I think there would have been chances of getting some age gap stuff. And if I had more time, I think it really would be interesting. Um, so the answer is no. However, I think that um, if we look back to that di diagram with the arrow going through, I would imagine that competition is more likely with a smaller age gap and collaboration perhaps with a larger one. So um, a documentary I watched recently was The Last Dance, Michael Jordan's documentary. I'm sure some of you have seen it. It was absolutely brilliant. And something that was, was just on my mind the whole time as I was watching it is how does someone get to be this competitive, get to be that completely obsessed with winning and get that um, riled up when there's someone on the other team who might be getting as good as them. And, and it just came through so strongly. And then you saw the moment where they interviewed him about his brother, his older brother and the comp then the close, close age and the competition they had for their father's attention. And you thought that's, that's a little gem there of trying to understand the mind of Michael Jordan. So I, I think that the age gap is important. From my work at Ministry of Football, we've had three children leave Ministry of Football and gone on to join Arsenal and Spurs Academy that are still at those, those academies. Kido Taylor Hart is now in the under 23s. The thing that joined all those three children together is that they had older siblings who had with a large age gap. So by large, I mean more than five years. All three of them did. And I don't think that's coincidence. I think that there's something about a large age gap that means that parents understand a little bit better where the pathways are through sports. So if their child gets into football, if you're a footballing kind of family, perhaps with the first child, 
you're not so sure, really sure where's really good coaching happen. Where does where do you go for this or that? Whereas with the later born, you 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 throw them in much earlier. They're on the sideline watching them. They just start doing things more earlier, and you you, you maybe. I, I don't know. There's more research to be done on that, certainly. But in my experience, I think it is important. Yeah. Um, access to peer groups. Um, we're going to look in a little bit at some of the uh, women's game. Uh, I've got a video to show you around that. And I think that really comes through strongly about the importance of being able to have mixed age play um, and about the importance of being able to join in with older siblings. So where I learned to play football in the park, there weren't any age groups. There really weren't. There was... I mean, there was all kinds of kids like older and younger. You just played. You didn't. You didn't go. Oh, we're we're all eleven, so we're playing on this pitch, and you're all thirteen, so you can play over there. It wasn't like that. We had one ball. We just played. So, but those kind of um, environments are rare, I think, and I think that's something that we we probably need to discuss around the importance of mixed stage play, um, and and being courageous enough to um, allow quite big gaps sometimes in those ages. Um, because I think it's, it's, it's where learning can happen. Roy Keane's a really good example. I mean, if Roy Keane hadn't had the opportunity to play up several years or to play in his brother's teams, um, Peter Beardsley is another one. He played for his brother's pub team when he was like 15 and his, and his, and his brother was, uh, you know, 18, 19. And the gap physically must have been huge. And Peter Beardsley wasn't a big chap either. And he said that's how he ended up being a tricky winger because, they, you know, he just had to shift that ball quick because they were going to take him out otherwise. So... These are really important um, areas of, of, uh, of learning. I'm glad we're getting questions like that, because I think access to those mixed ability and older peer groups is absolutely essential. Thanks, Mark. Um, I've had a couple come in from Tim, uh, Tim Sells. Tim, do you want to unmute and ask uh, Mark both your questions? It might be easier than me trying to read them both. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, Mark, is there, do you know, if there's any correlation between whether the older siblings were male or female to these Premier League players? Yeah, yeah. I think it's a great question. Um, again, it's, it's sometimes hard to get the data and I, I think, again, it would be fascinating. I do think... I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think there's examples both ways. I mean, if you're looking for examples, Maradona's older siblings are all female. So it's not a case that you need football playing older siblings. I'm, I'm not sure if it's about having football playing older siblings or about having older brothers. I think it's I, my personal view on it. And this is completely lack of evidence, but it's where I think this is happening is really, really young ages. I think it's when children are first born and they are learning to walk and they're learning to run after things and they're learning to balance, they're learning to do stuff and they have someone it doesn't need to be, it doesn't matter, I don't think, whether it's a boy or a girl who's a bit ahead of them, who they can either compete or emulate. But um, I do, I'd love to do more research on this, Tim. I think it's a great, great question. I think it would be really interesting to find out. Do you, um, finally, sorry, another one, Mark, but do uh, you know if any of the elite players who weren't the youngest child, so say, for example, they were the third one out of six, is there any information about whether their younger siblings also went on to be elite sports people? There's quite a few examples where they were. Uh, Maradona's both both Maradona's younger brothers, for example, um, professional footballers. That was something that came through very strongly when I was reading the autobiographies. It was so often the case that someone's uncle was an ex-professional, or someone's dad, or someone's older brother already made it as a professional. You, you seem to get football families where where it, this happens quite a lot. But I don't think we could really suggest that there's a. I don't know if this is what you were getting at, but with the, there's an ultimate order you want to be fourth born out of six or something because I don't think it works like that Wayne Rooney is a good example so Wayne Rooney's got younger brothers but but he and he was the first born so he but he was the one who made it professional but then when you read Wayne Rooney's story you realize that he spent his almost entire childhood when he wasn't at school playing street football with his older cousins and and mixed age play so he was the youngest so he he despite being the first born had um, a different environment he had sort of made that environment well he didn't made it himself but you know he, he had that environment where he was the youngest um artificially away from his family so um yeah more research needed there tim so um when i get there mate you can come and do data with me what do you think yeah. no that's great mate. <laughs> cheers brilliant so yeah it sort of links to um to that last question really so there was one more that came in just around 
Uh, any other families that you've come across that might have uh, similar levels of success in terms of elite sport? Sorry, families. Uh, family. I know, fam yeah, families that might have gone on to um, have members that have participated in elite sport, a bit like the Neville family. Mm. Didier Drogba is an interesting one. Again, firstborn. Um, firstborn of six, so big family. He's firstborn and he, he went on to... Uh, he left his family home um, with his parents when he was quite young because his uncle was a football scout, I think it was, and a boy football coach, and went to live with his cousins. So again, an example of, okay, you can see a firstborn, but actually they're, they're, they're still mixed age play. There's still people to emulate. There's still people to compete with above. You know, you're not putting that ceiling on the firstborn. You've, there, there's, another, there's another way. Um, but no, I mean, I would happily... Uh, share more stories, but I think um, we probably better move on, Kev, if that's all right. Go for it, mate. Okay. Um, right, so this is a bit of a summary thing. It's a very quick video, but what I was very aware of when I was um, presenting this is very male dominant, and it's something that I'm really, um, I, I wanted to do this research initially on the female game. I contacted the FA uh, and asked if you know, they could just put a quick survey out to all the age group players um, and all the international players that have played for England over, over a period of time. We could get hundreds of very quick responses and we could do this big data thing, but that wasn't something that they that they felt was was useful. So I've had to go and try and find stuff on, on YouTube from uh, female players. Um, and it's a very small sample. So what I want you to think here is not about quantity. I want you to listen to what the female players say and I want you to try while you're watching this video to relate this to these four components of learning. So um, we've got about six different England players and they're going to talk very briefly about their experience with siblings, older siblings. Um, and I'd like you to think about, are they talking about learners experience? Are they talking about that meaning? Did their older sibling help them um, um, identify who they were, what their purpose is, some kind of fundamental um, meaning around football and around getting into the game was it about practice was it literally about doing was it the situated learning that Dennis Bergkamp talked about the the way they played together was it about community was it that the older sibling accelerated their entry into a community or um, helped them accelerate to the middle of that community a bit quicker so that links to your sort of peer group perhaps learning um, that we talked about earlier or was it about identity who they became um, and Wenger uses the beautiful phrase of, of a meaningful trajectory i love that phrase it's one that i've that i've kept i'm going to steal it from etienne Wenger. but i think um you know does the older sibling provide that meaningful trajectory of this is who you become a bit like me as, as seb co and my brother as steve over there is someone to follow someone to go yeah i'm going to be that i'm going to be that when i go up um so hopefully the technology will work if you can't hear the sound after after a few seconds just give me a shout and we'll sort it out Yeah, I'd be in there every day that it was on, every hour I'd be in the gym, just constant football with all lads, just any lads that came in, they'd be three or four years old than me, I'd still be in the gym playing, a little girl running around with them all. I've got two brothers, I used to go down and watch them on a Saturday morning and they'd be like an Everton scout or a Liverpool scout and I'd be trying to impress and they'd just be looking at me as if to say, you're not male. I'm Lucy Bronze <laughs> and this is how I started. Growing up, it was always me against my brother. He was older and bigger than me, but I was competitive. Whatever he did, I did. I just wanted to beat him at everything. He played football, so I did. Although, I did love maths too. Mum wanted me to play tennis, but I liked being rough and tough in the mud. Oh, and tough is my middle name. No, really, it is. When I was six years old, I joined my brother's team. The other boys' teams used to laugh because there was a girl on the team. But after I made one cry, they soon stopped laughing. My mum said I always had a ball at my feet from when I could walk. And then I think my brother used to shove us in goal at the park. And I just loved the game. I did. I loved it. It was, it was difficult growing up because it was always me versus the boys. And I was the only girl in a boys team. And 
My older brother, um, you know, I think I was the, the, the pain in the backside little sister that loved to follow him around. Um, you know, I, I always wanted to do what my brother my brother did. So, he, you know, he played football, he played cricket, he, he, he ran for an athletics club, and I always wanted to follow and, and do exactly the same. My older sister, we used to kick like teddies around the house and things like that. And my mum was just like, well, I don't really want Karen around, she's bored, like, bored around the house. So sent me on to like, these football and multi-sports camps and then on, I just started kicking footballs around and it just went from there really. We had a football cage on concrete and that's where I started playing football with my brother and all the boys in the neighbourhood. Being the only girl, I had to fight for my place and let my football do the talking. Whilst playing for my brother's team, I was spotted by a ref and lucky for me, he was friends with the Arsenal ladies manager at the time. I had a trial and that was that. I joined Arsenal. So I'll just read that question out because I think it's a really pertinent one to, to finish the video on. How do we create programmes and structures in football which allow all young players to have older role models to compete with, collaborate with, follow and emulate. Okay, can you just give me a shout that we're back on the slides? Otherwise I'm worried we get lost. Yes, mate, all good. Okay, fantastic news, fantastic news. I do like it when the IT works. Um, so that, that's a bit of a summary. I'm not gonna take feedback on that in the moment, but I think what you see in the, what those um, players talk about is different, um, different descriptions of, of how older siblings help in this thing, this mysterious thing called learning in the sense of, they don't say that their brothers or sisters taught them to do something. They, they say that between the lines, they say that their, their brothers or sisters accelerated their entry into a community or, or um, gave them someone to copy, or it, there's ways that we talk about learning. This, this links very much this community to practice idea of what, what is learning. Learning can be this mysterious thing, but hopefully you saw examples of those four things at some stage or another. So um, I'm going to move on to this summaries and challenges and reflection, a um, bit more of a personal touch to it. Um, I think it's really important um, that, I, that I have a lot, spend some time just sort of talking about what I found I learned through it and what I found most difficult, etc. cetera. So um, some of this I've talked about already, available data. Um, it's really frustrating. I, I just think this is, this could be so big and it could be so important um, if we can get the right people to listen um, and get some, maybe some funding around how we, how we um, access that data. And um, especially, I mean, if you took some of those female players we just, we just talked about, um, we just listened to and really interviewed them in detail because that's just them talking. I just happen to have found it on YouTube, but they're not talking necessarily purposefully about their um, older siblings. And that's the struggle with using biographies. I've mentioned Yap Stam's one already, but um, there's very few footballers who write biographies talking about how they learned to do something. Um, in terms of the four components from Wenger, I think that meaning and identity seem to be more attributed to parents rather than older siblings. So in the example of De Canio, was it actually that they had a parent who was like that and therefore all of the children were? Or was it that De Canio was copying Antonio, his big brother? It's hard to know from reading the text. Again, you would want more information. But I feel that the practice side of it and the becoming side of it are very strong components in the context of football development. Now I've used social learning, but you then get things like this. Let's read this from David Beckham's autobiography. I think I was programmed by my dad to some extent. The training he gave me as a kid got me where I am today. We could work on passing, crossing, shooting. So um, for those of you who are a bit more um, literate in social learning and language than me, this is kind of behaviorist learning. He's talking about being programmed. He's talking about training. He's talking about work. It reminds me of when Andre Agassi talks about... Um, he talks about the times when he was little and, and if, he, if he did 20 perfect backhands, 20 perfect forehands, his dad would give him a cookie or something, you know, and it's, and it's kind of, this isn't social learning. This is repetition of program learning with a very behaviorist kind of reward at the end. And this worked for Beckham. Now Beckham's an odd one because he actually tell, talks in his, one of his very many autobiographies about his big sister who um, really didn't like football. It was his dad that got him into football. It wasn't, he does have an older sibling, but it was nothing to do with her that, that he got into football. So he's an odd one, doesn't quite fit the mold. And I think what we have to conclude is that one theory of learning, this social theory of learning, 
or looking at the older sibling is definitely being like this or this. It just doesn't work for everybody. There's lots more going on. There's lots of, there's 28 firstborn uh, players who, who made the list of 81. Um, so it's a lot more complicated than just saying, oh, it's about birth order or it's just about social learning. And Beckham's a good example of, um, of why that is or how that might look. I've used this term um, for reflections rather than what have I learnt, but things I have discarded and revised. So this is again thinking about social learning, thinking about what does this word learning mean? Is learning really just things that drop off and things that we change, things that we build, things that we say, I'll have a bit more of that and things that we go, yeah, I don't really, that question I was puzzled over for years, I don't really ask that question anymore, let's forget that. Is that what learning perhaps looks like in, in a sense? So things I've discarded and revised. So in terms of PE, um, I think there's this phrase I've heard recently, PE works best for those students who are most like their teacher. It doesn't have to be PE, it could be anything, but um, it could be any context. If you think of the context you work in, you work with learners. Are the learners who are most like you the ones who benefit most from your time? So in PE, it's one of the whitest subjects in school. Um, does it work for a 12-year-old Muslim girl um, to have a white workforce helping them try and learn movement skills? Is that what they need? Is, is in that community of practice or actually wouldn't it be better to set it up so that every child has an older sibling equivalent within the school who are like them who they can look up to who they can resonate with who have families that are similar etc um, so it's about how do we how do we help children move to full participation by full participation this is in capitalized letters because it's a Wengerian experience uh, um, phrase so he's talking about that that move from starting to join a community practice to actually being in the middle of being the center of it so understand all the vocabulary and the competence and having the confidence to to be fully engaged in that community of practice now for if you think about PE in sport and school some children will make that move and others will be very happy around the edge so what do we need to do in that community of practice to help children um, make that move towards full participation and again I think that relates to the courses that we run if we coach educators who are the ones who are fully participating in this learning today and who are the ones who aren't what do they need socially to help them get involved in this learning because otherwise we, we risk leaving people out and unfortunately in PE it's it's people who are most precarious or vulnerable in, in society generally who get left out and it just keeps uh, re repeating itself um, in terms of my own parenting, I found it fascinating just uh, thinking about um, why my children are different from each other and, and how that relates to some of the social learning theory that I've read about. Um, and I still find that really interesting. And one thing I'm trying to think of is, you know, I'm, I'm very much a parent who, who's same with a coach. I'm kind of put people in a situation, prepared environments, but I don't really do teaching or parenting in that sense. But what I've realised for my older child now is perhaps they need a little bit more from me. In terms of that meaningful trajectory, my youngest one has it because they have an older sibling, but perhaps my role as a parent for my older child is, well, I need to be that meaningful trajectory in a more purposeful way. So to talk about why I'm doing things, to talk about my passions a bit more, to, to, to help have something to follow. I've deliberately not done that because I want to be his own person, but, but there's the chance then that they just get lost. And so I'm thinking, actually, it's, it's a really powerful thing to do as a parent, to be that meaningful trajectory in a, in a much more purposeful way. Um, the big one here is links to the, my, my uh, degree in population studies. So um, I've, I've been thinking demographically for, um, for years and years. Whenever I'm Minister of Football, um, I keep detailed records of all the children who have come through um, the programme of how many um, different times they've spent in different groups. I've plotted pathways through for different children through the, through the programme. I've looked at relative age effect and when that starts and not. And, I become obsessed with it just because that's my background um, and it looks and, and, I, and I but I think when we actually think about skill development I'm not sure I think demographics is potentially more important than coaching so let me explain what I mean by that so here's um, a lot of you probably know Paul McGuinness um, so this is a this is a tweet he put up quite a while ago about intimidation by skill so he's talking about Ronaldinho and he's, he's got a list of things there that he's thinking, you know, this, these are the great things about Ronaldinho. Well, the question I have around that is, do those, th are these, are those things a result of coaching? They could be, they absolutely could be, but more they're a, re a result, I think, of relationships, especially relationships within families, of people's situations when they're growing up. 
and in Rondinho's example, about that gap between his, him and his older brother and his older brother's influence. I think that what FA education do, this is probably similar in other national governing bodies, is they assess with coaching rather than how, do, how have people learned to do stuff. And I think if we obsess with how have people learned to do stuff, we would acknowledge that coaching is a part of it, but actually demographic situations are probably just as important. So there's, there's research done that's looked at um, not just football, but uh, I think it's Olympic sports, when they found that there's a certain size of town, which is the perfect size for producing um, Olympic athletes. So if you look at London, for example, massive population, and we don't really represent as well as we should, given the amount, you know, I'm from London, I say we, um, given the number of people we have in London, we don't really produce as many people as we should. Tiny villages don't either, but there's a certain type size of town, uh, big enough to have enough people who play and compete together, but small enough that that doesn't get swamped or unsafe, that's perfect. So there's things that we can learn around how learning happens in the environments and context that we can then try and replicate artificially perhaps elsewhere that might replace this obsession with more and more and more and more coaching. Um, that's the end. That's the end. Look, there's, there's my brother. That's, my, that's big brother there in the shades. Look, um, I'll just send him a recording of this later and he can laugh at me and tell me, no, it wasn't like that, mate. It was something else. It's funny it, when you talk to siblings about the experiences after a while, you, you look back and you go, we, we really did see things differently. We have very different memories. So uh, that's a reminder that I suppose that what I've just gone through is very much a personal story. It's very much biased by my own experiences. And uh, feel free to interpret what I've presented in ways that fit your context. I'm hope, I hope that I've made you think. I hope I've made you uh, question stuff. Um, and if I have, then I feel that the, the last sort of hour and a bit has been worthwhile. Um, so um, what I'd like to do, and this is the really important bit for me, because this isn't something I've had the chance to do yet, is to find out from a group of really special people like you on the call, what does this actually mean? You all come from different contexts, but we are this community of practice. We share this vocabulary, this passion, this purpose, this endeavor. Um, let's, let's have a, some thinking time now about if this is important, this birth order stuff, what does it mean? What's the implications for us in our context? So think personally uh, about what does it mean and how does it help? And maybe it doesn't. Maybe you think, well, it's interesting, but it doesn't really help. That's fine. But I've never had this feedback yet. I haven't had a chance to get it. So I want to spend some time and I'll ask Kev to um, arrange the breakout rooms again, um, perhaps a little bit longer. Um, and we've got, I think, from a, a, a different way of collecting your feedback. Um, Kib, would you like to explain how we're going to collect uh, feedback for this one? Yes, mate. So, um, so we're not finished yet. We, we sort of want another maybe 10 minutes of your time if we can. Um, so the idea behind it is to, is to get your thoughts uh, and your feedback on what this means. And we're going to try and do that through um, a tool called Padlet. So you can use your, your phone. If you open up your camera and you hold it over the uh, black and white square, what you'll find is um, it will take you to uh, you know a link that says open in Safari, for example, and on there you'll find a, a plus button. And what we're looking for really is you to to go into the breakout rooms um, and to populate uh, your thoughts and feedback on there. And Mark can then see everybody's feedback live rather than bits and pieces coming in uh, through chat boxes. And then Mark can obviously keep that as one uh, document, a working document, moving forward. Um, so we'd really appreciate that if you could do that. And there's two ways to do it. So there's obviously the, the use of the phone um, opening your camera and doing it that way. And also being able to complete the, uh, the feedback on your phone. But also I've put in the chat box <coughs> um, a link that you could actually use. So if you copied that and opened up a, a window in your internet browser, you could then do it that way as well. So you can do it either way. Um, that would actually really support Mark moving forward with his research. Um, but we'd like you to sort of go off and discuss it again in the breakout rooms for maybe another, how long, Mark? 10 minutes? 10 minutes is enough, yeah. 10 minutes. When, when you come back, I've got um, a bit of a freebie to um, to show you, just so that, to keep you on the line, to keep you motivated. At the end of 10 minutes, I'll show you something really cool. There's nothing to do with this, but um, it'll, be, it'll be worthwhile. Yeah, it's, it's excellent, to be fair. So I've had a look at it. So I would recommend uh, sort of coming back and having a look at what Mark's going to show you because it's a really valuable tool. Uh, so I'm going to open up the breakout rooms now.